today we are going to overcoat cadmium selenide quantum dots in this four neck round bottom flask here. Uh, we have four ports two for injecting precursors, those are the ones with SEPTA. Here we have our nitrogen vacuum uh, connection and that is our temperature connection for our thermocouple. And here's the chemicals we're going to use, uh, topo, tetradecalphosphonic acid, uh, trioctylphosphine oxide topo, yeah, we actually distill that ourselves, so uh, when we, after we distill it, we pour, we pour it as a melt into these flasks here. So it's kind of difficult to work with, you have to, you have to break it up, um, it's a nice solid mass, so we have to break it up, powderize it, and I believe there's about four grams. Uh, what I'm doing there is not very smart, <laughs> using the, the, the mortar there to pour into the uh, whey tray. Um, I cannot be accused of having perfect experimental skills. Uh, the, one of the reasons you, you really got to powderize it is that you got to get it into the foreneck and that's actually kind of difficult. It's tempting to try to get it into tiny chunks, but if one of them gets, gets stuck there, uh, good luck. Uh, again, these septa are how we're going to inject our zinc and sulfur precursors, which are very air sensitive, and we're going to inject those through capillary uh, capillaries that we have connected to little syringes that go on a syringe injector. Okay, now this is where this gets funky. It's tempting to weigh out the cadmium for the cadmium shell, but we can't do that yet because we have to prep the core cad selenide quantum dots first. Here, well, here, here are cores, and we have a video on making the cores, and we're going to uh, process them by size selective precipitation. You can see that they were the cores were partially solidified, so we have to either heat gun it uh, or just use extra solvents. And we're pouring that into a. This is technically a falcon tube, a um, a tube for for growing cells, but it works pretty well for what we're doing here, which is we we've gotten into the tube. Now we're adding some isopropanol, which you see mixes well with the dots, which we had also used a little hexane. And the, the purpose of the isopropanol is so that methanol, as you see here, mixes, and the dots are, are very nonpolar, so they are precipitating, and that's why you see that snow globe type of appearance. The topo and all the extra precursors are perfectly soluble in methanol. Uh, so we've centrifuged it, it looks like nothing's happened. Oh, actually, it did crash out. You have to be a little careful. Uh, they, they coat the side of the tube, and so if you look at it at just the right angle, it's like, it looks like nothing happened. I always thought that was kind of funny. So we decant the liquid, and there you go. We're going to precipitate them one more time. You don't have to do this, and it's a little dangerous because if, if you precipitate, precipitate them too many times, they'll lose too many surface ligands, and if that, if that happens, it's probably best to start over. You have to just know your own materials well enough to know how many times you can precipitate them. Now note that I did not add that much hexane. You see maybe just less than, uh, less than five meals. That's because it helps to precipitate the dots if they're concentrated. They, they kind of like find each other a little bit easier in the precipitation process. What I'm doing here is now that I've precipitated them a second time, and this is why you gotta be careful about how many times you precipitate them, I'm now adding a known quantity of hexane so that when I take a portion of the QDs from this, this is basically a stock solution, I'm gonna take a portion of this, go do a UV vis spectrum, calculate the concentration, and then knowing how many dots that, that what my original volume was, the concentration of dots in my cuvette, I can back calculate the total a la freshman chemistry type um, dimension analysis. Um, my regression for calculating the concentration of QDs in my stock uh, is based on knowing the first absorption feature, uh, which tells me the size, and then the absorptivity at 350 nanometers, for which I have the Beer's Law coefficient. So now I know the number of QDs, and from this I then know how many cadmium, zinc, and sulfur precursors. So I'm going to do a cad zinc sulfide shell, because that's how you get those 100% quantum yield, like about 50% zinc, 50% cadmium. But I need to know the number of dots before I know how much cadmium I need. So that's why I quantified the number of dots. You saw me adding cadmium. And that's usually not too much, it's usually like 20 milligrams. And then I'm adding the tetradecal phosphonic acid, 
Um, hexylphosphonic acid also works. I tend to use tetradecylphosphonic acid. I made that myself. And I, you have to add a little over two molar equivalents compared to cadmium. If I'm not using a lot of cadmium, then I'll just shoot for half a gram of tetradecylphosphonic acid. So in other words, I add a minimum of half a gram of tetradecylphosphonic acid. That's what I'm adding here. Uh, but I'll add more if I'm using more cadmium. And the, the reason this whole procedure is a little extra complicated is because I need to know how much cadmium and phosphonic acid to add. Because here you see me connecting it to the uh, Schlink line. Um, so what I do is I degas, degas it, get all the water out, and then I'm going to heat it up to 250 and back down, which forces the cadmium, that's cadmium acetate, it forces the cadmium acetate to react with the phosphonic acid to form cadmium phosphonate. That you have to do above 200 degrees. I usually do 240 for just a few minutes, and then I cool it back down and, and, uh, and do more vacuum. You have to do that before you add the QDs to the pot. It's terribly important that you make the CAD phosphonate first and then add the QD second. That's why you have to know how many QDs you have to know how much cadmium to add, how much phosphonic acid to add, heat it up, cool it back down, and then we're going to add the QDs. Okay, so here you're seeing, uh, this is time lapsed, uh, you see the QDs melting. And this is going to be under vacuum, uh, get rid of whatever water. I think the topo probably picks up a lot of water. It's kind of old at this point, and, and we did distill that ourselves. Um, I forgot to mention we add TOP. Uh, th this is all described in the reference, so that was the very beginning of this video. Uh, TOP is from the glove box. I'm not showing that part. Uh, it's from the glove box, and you notice that I used a green needle to inject that. That's because topo is air sensitive. So we're heating it up to 250, back down. Now we have the cadmium phosphonate, topo, TOP, and now we're adding the QDs. So and that was about four mils in a stock solution in hexane. Again, I had taken a portion of that out to quantify the number of dots. Now you gotta be real careful about this. We gotta pull off the hexane, and this is the longest part of the process, and you gotta be real careful, you can see, yeah, see that? See how those uh, dots were welling up there? Uh, that, that can get pretty scary. If they shoot up the tubing and into your schlink line, you're, you're done. So this part can take a very long time, the QDs. Uh, they're not very bright at this point. You can barely see anything. Uh, but the removal of hexane can take a, a pretty long time. And usually you want to give it a, usually I do it at 80 degrees because even at 80 degrees under vacuum, you have maybe a minimum of one hour wait, but it's usually more like two or three. We have a pressure, you can actually see the pressure gauge on our Schlink line. We have a pressure gauge that tells us when all the, when all the hexane has um, been removed. So again, you can see a bubble and it really takes a long time. That's the hexane very, very slowly coming out. Now, uh, after I've decided that the hexane is gone, I add the decalamine. Uh, I forgot how, I think it's a little under three grams decalamine. And I've used dodecalamine as a replacement, and that's described in the paper. And I found the dots weren't quite as bright, so I usually stick with decalamine. And you may notice that the dots are getting a little brighter. You can actually see some green emission before you couldn't really see anything. And it is best to leave this for several hours. Usually, usually I do this overnight. Uh, there's always the issue of the topo just getting you know, kind of splattered up along the sides of the foreneck, so I regularly heat gun that off. Really important to do when you're actually overcoating. We're still in the preparation phase here. Again, the decalamine is really doing a number. It, it brightens the dots considerably. And notice this is really kind of, kind of an artificial brightness. If you take those dots out and you know pretend that they're overcoated and precipitate them and try to use them, they'll actually lose all their brightness by the time you're done processing them. Um, that does not happen with core shell dots and that's why we make core shell dots. Again, they get brighter and brighter as time passes and I recommend several, several hours overnight. Just do it overnight and that way you just don't have to think about it. But, but again, right, the, you can see that the brightening is dramatic and the dots will actually even get brighter once we inject, so here you see me make, I'm preparing the zinc solution and I'm using diethyl zinc. Again, everything is described in the paper. 
and I'm also making a TMS sulfide solution. I'm putting those in separate syringes. And all of these precursors, TMS sulfide is air sensitive, diethyl zinc is explosively air sensitive. I know I said in the last video on CAD selenide, don't do this if you don't know what a glove box is. I'm inspecting the gloves for holes and you have to be really careful when handling TOP. TOP will melt the gloves. So I typically take get two vials, add three mils TOP to each. Uh, so I ought to be playing the Benny Hill music here. So there's the TOP. I've just sped this up because this, this can take about half an hour. Uh, so I take three mils TOP into two vials and into one I'm adding diethyl zinc and into the other one I'm adding TMS sulfide. I rinse I, and, I, and I measure those out with those uh, green needles because it gives me fine control and then I rinse the green needles in the solution before loading them into five mil syringes here and uh, then I take those out of the glove box. So again big picture diethyl zinc and TOP, TMS sulfide and TOP and I, of course I take out all the equipment that I use to make those solutions and I wash those immediately and dispose of them. Okay, one of the more clever things here is that you can see these little um, little coupling devices that we got from Upchurch Scientific. So I'm quickly removing the, the needle from that was on there from the glove box that keeps it um, keeps air out. These are not terribly air sensitive at this point. The diethyl zinc especially has been diluted. It's not going to catch on fire. So I'm adding these little coupling devices that uh, that attach at those thin capillary tubes, uh, which th those can actually be gas chromatography capillaries. And then you notice that I've got the capillary, I've got a green needle, a gate, 21 gauge green needle threaded through the capillary. I'm loading them into, that's my favorite syringe injector. You, you can't buy those anymore, but I love that thing. I've had it for 15 years. And uh, actually, I think I'm speeding up time here, so you can uh, you can see you can see it move a little bit. So you can see what happens is the syringe injector pushes on the solution, and you see how I, I thread it through. The needle goes through. I then snake the capillary further into the vessel, and then I pull the needle out. You need to pull the needle out because it would allow, allow air to get in. And I do that with both sides, and now the syringe injector is going to slowly, over the course of at least three or four hours, inject those solutions. So you can see that better here. For small, if I'm overcoating small QDs, I'm going to be injecting at first around 160, 180. Small dots are sensitive, and you can't overcoat them very hot. But as they get bigger and bigger, uh, you notice that they're redshifting as more zinc and, and sulfur are are overcoating them, they're red shifting. You have to, you, you notice that there's a little bit of green residue dots that are stuck on top. You have to be really careful with that. If they get stuck up there, just make sure they stay there or try to heat gun them down. So you notice the dots are, are red shifting bit by bit. Uh, and as the dots red shift, meaning they're getting bigger, I will raise the temperature up to maybe 220, 240. Now this is much lower than what you may have read about add me adding pure CAD sulfide, um, especially if you're using uh, octane thiol as a sulfur precursor. These like lower temperatures. Okay, we're done. The solution, so I'm gonna cool the solution down to room temperature and pack it up. I also know how many QDs there are in that vessel, so I can weigh the amount of growth solution and know how many QDs there are per gram growth solution. And so I'll do that when I make water-soluble dots for bioimaging. Those capillaries have to be immediately cleaned. If not, they'll get topo in them. They're pretty expensive. So those have to be cleaned within about a minute of taking them out of the vessel. Otherwise, they'll get clogged with TOP. And I know the QDs, they don't look good. The camera's kind of accentuating that, they, um, especially when they're still hot. It kind of looks like a lot of organic decomposition, but when you turn out the lights and hold up the lamp, they are very, 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 very bright, and they're very resilient to processing, and I have gotten as high as 100% quantum yield doing this method in the past. So, there you go. I hope you enjoyed, and uh, check back our channel for more synthetic tricks in the future.